Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for uh, having me uh, present to you today. I apologise, I'm a little bit under the weather, so um, I apologise for my coughing and spluttering if uh, that was to eventuate during this presentation. So, um, as Mark said, I'm a partner at Holland Wilcox. I sit primarily in um, the financial services team, so I do anything that's really financial services related, um, so that's really anything that needs an AFSL, ACL, or uh, more recently restricted ADI applications. Um, the way I sort of got involved in blockchain was a client came to me in 2017, and, and, and the reason I'm going to tell this story is just to sort of explain the commercial opportunity for professional services, which is directly relevant to you. Um, yeah, a client came to me and said they wanted to create an index fund of cryptocurrencies, um, and it was a funds manager, one-on-one -on -one advice, sort of stuff that I do every day. Um, but at the time, Bitcoin and blockchain was all over the headlines, as were ICOs. And I thought to myself after that matter, I don't know anything about Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, it seems closely related to the work that I'm doing. I should go and educate myself so I can at least have an intelligent conversation um, with clients about it because it seems like I'm going to get a bit more of um, the work in this space. So I started reading about Bitcoin and blockchain. And the more I read, the more I wanted to read. And it was like going down a bit of a rabbit hole. And after a couple of months, I thought to myself, well, this is just an amazing technology. It's going to touch our lives in so many ways, personally, professionally, through government. The technology is going to be everywhere. I want to try to stay ahead of the curve here. So I started writing all these articles about the legal implications of undertaking ICOs, legal implications of setting up cryptocurrency exchanges, just general updates on, on, on blockchain um, and setting up crypto funds. And never in my life have I had so many cold contacts of people reaching out to me than with respect to that material that I put out back then. And it's just grown ever since. And the opportunity from a professional um, services perspective has been um, phenomenal for me. Um, as Mark said, I also sit on the board of um, Blockchain Australia, which is the peak industry body for blockchain, which um, is involved heavily in the government lobbying um, to get regulations in place, and I'll talk a little bit more about that throughout the presentation. So just a very high overview, and I'll go into more detail in, in relation to a number of these items um, throughout the presentation. We don't have any specific laws for blockchain at the moment. Um, the only things that are sp uh, specific to crypto are uh, GST being removed uh, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, recently, there was uh, a bill released that uh, basically says that um, uh, cryptocurrencies are not foreign currency for tax purposes and digital currency exchanges are required to register with Austrac, which is the anti-money laundering uh, regulator in Australia. ASIC has put out some guidance for total sales, basically saying that um, they could be a financial product, um, but again, they're applying existing principles. Same with the ATO, they've put out some crypto-specific guidance, but again, applying uh, existing principles. Um, in 2021, uh, a Senate inquiry produced a report which had, um, I think it was 12 recommendations, all but one of those recommendations were then accepted by the then Liberal government. Almost all of those recommendations revolved around uh, blockchain. Um, and the then Liberal government said that they wanted to implement legislation um, in respect of all of the recommendations that were made within one year. Um, but obviously there's been a change of government since and I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, in March 2022, Treasury released a consultation paper for a licensing regime for digital currency exchanges and custody service providers. Um, and that was released under the then obviously Liberal government. Um, in April of this year, APRA, uh, the prudential regulator for our banks and insurers and superannuation companies um, set out some principles relating to risk management and a policy roadmap um, that they intend to follow. And Senator Bragg, who led the Senate inquiry uh, when he was in government, um, has recently, while in opposition, released a draft digital assets market regulation bill to... Um, licensed crypto asset service providers in line with the consultation that was released in March uh, 2022. And I'll go into further detail 
on that shortly. I'll start with the guidance that ASIC has put out. Uh, info sheet 219 ASIC basically says that the existing regulatory framework is sufficient for distributed ledger technology and we don't need any uh, specific uh, laws and the existing regime can accommodate it. Um, I beg to differ, but in any event, they do point uh, the reader to the Innovation Hub for assistance and um, they note a particular fintech licensing exemption. Uh, information sheet uh, 225, initial coin offerings in cryptocurrency, has had various iterations uh, since 2018, probably four, I think. Um, but basically in it, it, ASIC says that crypto assets may or may not be a financial product, and it depends on the features of the particular um, token, and it's a substance over form issue. Um, but ASIC has been quite clear that Bitcoin is not a financial product. And they put forward this view in a Senate inquiry in 2014, um, in which they said that digital currencies are not financial products. Um, and the big difference between Bitcoin and a lot of tokens that exist in today's um, crypto market is that Bitcoin, there was never an actual sale of tokens. The, the, the Bitcoins were all mined. And that makes a big difference because to the extent that you sell the tokens and um, the proceeds of that sale are used to do something to enhance the value of what you've sold, then you potentially enliven uh, capital raising laws under the Corporations Act, including um, uh, Chapter 60 in relation to the issue of securities and Chapter 7 potentially with respect to other types of financial products. In Australia, the most relevant potentially are um, manage investment schemes, which have a very broad definition, and um, non-cash payment facilities. Um, if it's not a financial product, then it would be treated as a commodity, as it says, and then you would be subject to the general laws of uh, misleading and deceptive conduct. And importantly, if they are a financial product, then they can't be listed on ordinary crypto asset exchanges, uh, and they would need to be uh, listed on uh, an exchange that has an Australian markets license, such as uh, the ASX has, or done under an AFSL with a maker market authorization on it. Um, the Senate inquiry that was conducted by Bragg, or led by Bragg, I should say, um, generally speaking, I should say, and this is going to be relevant later on, that it was generally speaking a bipartisan uh, report. Um, there were 12 recommendations. Um, the um, it was quite significant in that almost everyone from, everyone from the industry said, look, we need a regulatory regime uh, for the crypto industry. Um, and the key recommendations uh, were that there be a, a licensing regime be established for digital currency exchanges that uh, had capital requirements, auditing, responsible person tests uh, within the Treasury portfolio. Um, that the government establish a licensing regime for custody service providers in respect of digital assets, and that the government establish a new decentralised autonomous organisation company structure. At the moment, decentralised autonomous organisations are not recognised as a particular type of entity under Australian law, um, and could be construed potentially as a partnership or an unincorporated association. However, the Corporations Act has limits on the number of people that can be part of a partnership, uh, subject to certain exemptions that um, uh, are contained in the regulations for professional service firms. Um, but that limit is 20 people. So if you, if you um, establish a DAO in Australia and it has more than 20 people, technically you're required under the uh, Corporations Act to incorporate. Um, and if they haven't incorporated, well, what are the legal implications of that um, that this is a, a topic that has been raised by the Australian Law Reform Commission recently in relation to its review of um, the Corporations Act. Um, and another key recommendation is that the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism um, Financing Act be um, clarified to ensure that it's fit for purpose uh, when it applies to digital assets. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in March 2022, off the back of that Senate uh, inquiry, uh, Treasury released a consultation paper that proposed a licensing regime for crypto asset service providers at a very high level. It is based on the AFSL regime, has similar requirements, 
but it is not an AFSL. Um, it uh, suggested a single licensing regime um, that would have separate authorizations for those that um, operated digital currency exchanges and those that provide custody of digital assets. Um, similar to the requirements that apply to AFSL holders, um, they'd be required to do all things necessary to ensure that the services covered um, are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Um, and operated in a fair, transparent, orderly manner, uh, to have adequate technological and financial resources, manage risks, uh, have adequate dispute resolution, various client money obligations, and a requirement to be audited. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Australian Law Reform Commission is doing a review of the Corporations Act as a whole. Um, it's not specific to the information um, that is on this slide. Um, but it discusses technological innovations in financial services sector and specifically considers reforms for the recognition of uh, crypto assets and decentralised autonomous organisations. Um, to that effect, the ALRC suggests that regulation should be uh, driven by the function performed by the crypto asset or the DAO and necessary obligations attaching to um, activities associated with the crypto asset or DAO rather than being uh, driven by the technology itself. Uh, which makes sense, and they have suggested that it may be appropriate to include a new term in the legislation to reflect the definition of crypto assets. However, um, the label and definition used to describe the concept should be considered carefully. Um, they also note in their paper that uh, while there are advantages of allowing DAOs to adopt a corporate form, um, such an approach detracts from a uh, DAO's decentralised autonomous nature as it requires a human agent or representative to be appointed on behalf of the DAO. Um, possible design choices for DAOs um, include that they operate in a purely decentralised unwrapped form, uh, which is treated as an unincorporated association or, or something similar, or a wrapped or hybrid arrangement under which a DAO operates through a company or a corporate form. Um, all of these things are still to be worked through. Um, these are just, uh, it's really just a discussion paper that's been released by the Australian Law Reform Commission. Um, there's a lot of information on this page, but basically, um, in, in relation to the first column, the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill, uh, it's basically um, uh, s stating that uh, digital currency and dig uh, cryptocurrencies are not foreign currencies for the purposes of the Income Tax Assessment Act. Um, the second column is the Digital Assets Market Regulation Bill, which I mentioned earlier that Senator Bragg, while in opposition, has released um, for consultation. Um, basically, it proposes uh, a licensing regime for digital ex uh, currency exchanges and digital asset custody service providers. But interestingly, and this was not in the previous consultation, um, the issue of stable coins uh, should, where it's 100% fiat backed, need to also be licensed under this bill. Um, interestingly, um, he also included a provision in relation to a requirement on the various Chinese banks that operate in Australia um, having to report on the um, their dealings with the um, central bank digital currency issued by China uh, within Australia. And that's just really a, a monitoring um, and reporting uh, obligation for the time being. Um, Blockchain Australia had suggested that um, we not specifically target China within the actual legislation and rather give the minister a, a power to uh, declare central certain central bank digital currencies subject to these uh, requirements through a, a designation so that it wouldn't be so overtly targeted at China. Um, there is also an, uh, a proposed exemption for uh, foreign <coughs> operators, excuse me, where they hold a license of a recognised foreign exchange covering that activity and that uh, recognised foreign exchange basically means that there's substantially similar um, regulations are in place. So we'll see what happens with that. Because uh, he's an opposition, I don't 
um, expect that um, it's going to go very far, but at least he's keeping the conversation going. Now, the current Labor government has uh, announced in uh, August that they are going to undertake a token mapping exercise. Um, what that means is uh, assessing the various types of tokens and determining um, effectively whether or not they should be regulated uh, as financial products under the existing regime or they fall into everything else. Um, that is, uh, we expect that that consultation um, will be released um, by the end of this year, um, but we don't have any sort of hard time frames. This is just sort of what I've heard on the grapevine. Uh, Board of Tax um, is also um, released a consultation um, asking people to come forward with any uh, issues um, that they think are relevant in relation to digital currencies uh, in particular. I won't go through the various <coughs> excuse me, um, heads by which they're uh, considering these things. APRA guidance, um, so as I mentioned earlier, APRA released some guidance earlier this year. Uh, focusing around focusing on uh, risk management, um, and they suggest that uh, before you before a regulated entity that is regulated by APRA uh, invests in crypto assets, um, they need to take uh, undertake a risk assessment, and they need to consider various things, including whether uh, the relevant entity holds sufficient capital. Um, ensure that entities that invest in crypto assets have robust investment strategies and can demonstrate investments are in the best interests of members. Uh, credit risk management concerns and, and think about how that's relevant and what's used as collateral. Uh, the way in which crypto assets might impact existing risk management assessments, including in relation to liquidity, uh, markets, concentration, operational risks, and uh, fraud and asset security uh, concerns. They've also set out a uh, policy roadmap, um, which obviously, you and as you would expect, um, revolves around the Basel um, Committee consultation on, on crypto assets. Basel Committee um, is the uh, global body that basically sets standards for um, the international uh, banking re <coughs> regulators. Um, so by 2025, I think we're going to have um, a little bit more uh, clarity, and, and we have that roadmap. Um, various other things that need to be taken into account are listed on that slide, and I won't go through each of those. Austrac, so Austrac, um, as mentioned earlier, is the uh, regulator for digital currency exchanges in Australia, but only with respect to um, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing issues. They are not otherwise regulated in any way from a... Um, prudential or uh, capacity or any any uh, other uh, realm. It's really just the um, anti-money laundering where you have to do KYC on your clients, etc. They've released two um, guidance papers that are quite specific to digital currency exchange businesses. Um, and the first is a guide to preparing and implementing an AML CTF program for digital currency exchange businesses and uh, preventing criminal abuse of uh, digital currencies uh, financial crime guide, which was released in April of this year. Um, one of the uh, issues that was at the forefront of the Senate inquiry that Bragg conducted was that um, a lot of fintech companies, remittance service providers and digital currency exchanges are being debanked uh, without explanation by their banks. Um, and the and recently, uh, Austrac has put out a, a paper basically saying that you should not be debanking people purely based on the industry that they are in and that you should actually be undertaking a risk-based approach based on the individual client and their circumstances. Um, hopefully it makes a difference, but um, I'm not really necessarily going to be holding my breath on that because... Ultimately, it's a decision for the banks and they will say, well, is it really worth my time and effort to do due diligence on this client um, to satisfy myself that they're not a risk to me? Like commercially, um, the, the answer to that's probably going to be no, or if it is yes, then it's going to be in very limited circumstances. Um, 
FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, which sets the anti-money laundering standards globally, has um, put out a recommendation uh, which is known as the travel rule. And the travel rule is that um, exchanges, digital currency exchanges, need to transmit um, beneficiary and um, transfer or details with respect to any transfers of cryptocurrencies between exchanges. Um, when FATF put out that recommendation, there was no software in place that could actually do what they had suggested. Um, Austrac is coming around now to um, the view that that software now exists and I expect that the travel rule will be implemented in Australia um, sometime soon, but we don't know when. We don't even have a draft bill just yet. Um, but in discussions with Austrac, um, it's clear that it is coming, but uh, it's a matter of when, uh, not if. Various international bodies are also doing various things, and I'll just go through uh, the three that are listed here. So the Financial Stability Board, um, it monitors and provides recommendations about uh, the global financial system, um, and they uh, are considered by the IMF as the most suitable body to develop uh, international standards on uh, stablecoin arrangements. Um, they're working to ensure crypto assets are subject to robust uh, regulation and supervision. They recently published the risk assessment on crypto assets that outlined its concerns over the rapid growth of crypto assets. And the FSB, in collaboration with FATF, which I, I mentioned earlier, is focusing on the regulation and supervision of unbacked crypto assets and stable coins, as well as analysing the financial stability uh, implications of decentralised finance. FSB has also published nine recommendations for uh, the regulation, supervision and oversight of crypto asset activities uh, based on internationally uh, consistent guidelines. The FSB considers existing legal principles uh, that regulate traditional financial market can be applied to regulate uh, the crypto market. World Economic Forum also um, has put out some guidance saying um, they're looking to ensure that blockchain securely decentralizes the transfer of information in ways that reduce uh, corruption and increase trust and empower users. They're particularly concerned with the possible global macroeconomic effects of cryptocurrencies and stable coins, um, where they might have spillover effects into uh, traditional markets. And they've recently commented that continuing the current indecisive approach for regulating digital currencies is the least effective and sustainable option for supporting monetary and financial stability. And the most effective option is to allow digital currencies to play a regulated role in the financial market. Um, and they're looking to uh, publish best practices um, by the end of this year. IOSCO, IOSCO is the International Organization of Securities Commissions, basically the global body um, in relation that uh, <clears throat> brings together the world's securities regulators um, and is recognized as the global standard setter. Um, they have established a board level fintech task force, um, which is mandated to develop, oversee, uh, deliver and implement IOSCO's regulatory agenda for fintech and crypto assets. Um, Australia is a member of IOSCO, so you can expect that um, we will likely follow any recommendations that come out of IOSCO. Um, and they've recently provided some guidance in relation to um, stablecoin uh, arrangements. That's it for me. I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> DAO, D Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So basically it's a blockchain protocol where people hold tokens and nothing is done in respect of that protocol unless, unless there is a vote taken. So what it does is create an organization which doesn't have a, a legal um, form whereby it democratizes what occurs in respect of that particular blockchain without any central management and control. No, not really. No, it would operate uh, that particular blockchain, whatever that blockchain does.
So it would set the rules for that blockchain. Um, okay, so there is uh, an Australian outfit called um, Mycelium, which has established Tracer DAO. Tracer DAO is a um, software protocol that is blockchain based that um, that allows people to create financial products on a peer-to-peer -peer basis and they vote the, the, the token holders who are part of the DAO vote on what should or shouldn't be done in respect of that blockchain. So then someone might put up a proposal to say, oh, we want to create this type of financial product and therefore we need to engage someone to um, change the, our blockchain protocol to facilitate that being able to occur. That would require us to pay them this much money f through the tokens that have been issued so people vote. Do you vote yes or no to these people undertaking this change to the protocol and paying them this amount of money? That's an example. D banking is basically when you get your account closed, bank account closed with, without notice. Well, the banks don't usually give a reason, which is one of the problems and, and why people were throwing their arms up saying, well, you're not giving us a reason, so we can't address whatever your concerns may be. But they're entitled to because it's a free market. I don't have to do business with you. Unfortunately, though, the, the reality of it is in today's society, you can't operate either as a human, like just as an individual or a business without a bank account. And my personal view is that, well, given that, there should be an entitlement to have a bank account, but that's not the law of the land. Uh, ANZ is working on a stable coin. Um, other banks are involved in the central bank digital currency um, pilot programs that are being undertaken by the Reserve Bank of Australia with the um, CRCs, but I'm not, I'm not aware of them actually trying to develop their own digital currencies other than stable coins by, by ANZ. Um, it's more efficient settlement of transactions, so virtually instantaneous. So if ANZ has a, a, issues a stable coin, and I'm pretty sure off the top of my head they're limiting it to like wholesale clients, um, it, it's just instantaneous settlement if, if you pay in, in stable coin, rather than waiting for like if it's an international transfer, doing a swift transaction which will take whatever it is, three days or whatever it is. Yes, definitely, yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, <clears throat> the, the central banks around the world are, are trying to play catch up by potentially issuing their own central bank digital currencies because they can see that benefit or that aspect of blockchain um, and cryptocurrencies that um, they can't really compete with for international transfers in particular. Uh, in theory, it shouldn't because, generally speaking, it should be backed on a one-for-one -one basis. For, so for every token, there should be a dollar held in reserves. But in practice, it does fluctuate slightly. Um, don't ask me why. I can't answer that question. <laughs> but it does. Um, but there are some stable coins that are not backed by fiat. Um, and one big one which you may have heard of earlier this year that blew up was uh, an algorithmically based stable coin called Luna, and that just blew up and went to zero. Um, there are stable coins that are backed by other types of assets, such as precious metals, for example, um, but there, there's different types of stable coins, but the best is probably the fair backed ones. Number. Now, the bankrupt's never going to get to that number. If you 
is, is the government going to bring in regulations that make a council this look like a council? Uh, I don't know that that's been something that's been on the agenda. Um, but having said that, I do know that the ATO writes to all of the exchanges and says, give me all the information that you have in relation to all of your clients. So they do data matching in relation to people when they do their tax returns. But that specific um, point I haven't seen uh, be raised before, but it's a, a valid one. And I, I would have thought that um, it should be one that's raised through, um, is it ITSA or what, what's it called? Uh, whatever it is these days, yeah. And that, Correct. Yeah. So, you know, you're walking around for thousands of dollars. Yeah. And no one knows. Yeah, that's right. And so the trustee can't find out. Yeah. Uh, unless you undertake a very sophisticated um, tracing exercise, which uh, Mark can tell us about. <laughs> Um, it's a good question and uh, what people talk about in the industry is someone coming up with the killer app and the killer app is one that makes it so easy and user friendly for your average Joe to be able to do this but I, I don't know how unless that app is also decentralized you're still going to have a central point of failure potentially by having someone that owns that app if that that is, is in fact the case. Yeah. That's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. I'll have to look into that one. So it doesn't matter where the entity is, if they're operating in Australia, they'll need to have 
a license. It doesn't matter where they're located. So what they'll usually do is set up an Australian subsidiary to hold that license in Australia. Yeah, but once the licensing regime is in, there'll be a lot more, for want of a better word, transparency in relation to, you know, where they're located and um, who's behind it and, and what their um, capacity is to do what they're doing because it'll all be a condition of having the licence. If they're not operating in Australia, correct. It, yeah, it's a really good question and I don't have a silver bullet answer for you, but um, I can tell you this, um, a lot of businesses are moving towards uh, blockchain, so you may know that the ASX is developing a chess settlement system which is blockchain based. Um, that's had a lot of pushback because it can actually put a lot of people out of business, your brokers, your registry services and, and whatnot. So there's been delay after delay after delay. Uh, some of it's technical, uh, granted, but there's a lot of politics involved in it as well. So that's an example of where you'll see uh, blockchain. Um, the market for, for crypto at the moment is purely speculative. And it's hard to see um, through all of that what's going to ultimately survive and um, be things that are going to be around just because they're so useful because everyone's just focusing on the speculation on wanting to get rich quick and whatnot. But, um, you know, all of your, um, f what, are, what are they called, the top four accounting firms or whatnot now, all have specialist um, blockchain teams now and they do blockchain consulting to corporates to enhance their businesses and make them more efficient using blockchain. What... I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in supply chain. That's an example. Um, so there's stuff going on in wine, beef, um, diamonds. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on, but you're just not going to know about it. It's just going to be like, um, I don't know, I, I use an Excel spreadsheet. Do I need to know the code behind this Excel spreadsheet? You're just not going to know about it. But it will be there if that makes sense. <laughs> kind of. No, it doesn't. No. no. So I think what you're saying is that blockchain could be much more widely utilised as a as a form of efficient transaction. Correct. But that that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that that there's going to be more use of crypto. It, it doesn't, but I think there will be more use of crypto as well. Yeah. In addition to blockchain being there. like there'll be. People will create things, and I don't, I don't have a, uh, I can't tell you what it is exactly, but people will come up with things whereby cryptocurrency makes perfect sense 
for the economy that they've created for that particular crypto and people will use it in time. What that looks like exactly, I don't know. So for example, I can tell you, um, Elon Musk is gonna introduce payments to Twitter. I, I, I can, I'll bet you hundred bucks at least <laughs> that there'll be crypto attaching to it some way, shape or form. I think I've heard about that, yeah. Australian company's done that. It's called Beef Ledger. Yeah. Secondly, you've got frauds they're dealing with every day. The majority of them are cryptocurrency frauds. Um, no reason, for instance, they could even name the districts in Sydney where it was all coming from, and they were naming them, and and uh, and, and which which um, overseas countries they all came from. And then the biggest one they put on the table was a recent app formed by the ATO, which had caused 800 million of fraud. Um, Commonwealth Bank is uh, probably ahead of the rest. I can't say that definitively. I know that they uh, did quite a number of uh, trials of blockchain in supply chain um, a couple of years ago. And I think maybe a year or two ago, they also announced that they're going to make crypto available to their clients through a partnership with Gemini, I think it was. Um, I don't know where that's gone. But on, on the fraud... Sorry? Yeah, it was just basically ma making crypto available to their clients. Um, but interestingly, what they said was that they would only allow their clients to acquire it and hold it, not take it out. So they would have to keep it on or sell it. Um, on the fraud point, I, I, th th there's um, software tracing um, firms that track uh, all of the illicit activity on uh, crypto and blockchain. And Mark can probably speak to this better than I can. But the statistics coming out of it are that only 0.37% of all transactions um, are illicit in crypto. But it gets the headlines. It gets the headlines. Nothing's been said about it, but it's cost in fraud 
fraud. And I, I didn't quite, um, they were all young blokes and I didn't quite understand what they were talking about. Yeah. Fraud's basically a sack of wood. If you go to the Coliseum and you walk down the lane and buy a ticket off the dog guy down the back, you're going to be scammed. And that's essentially what's happening with the Fraud's guy. Yeah. So new technology, they're getting overexcited and greedy and trying to make a fast buck and they're getting involved with down the lane and you're just taking the money off them. So, so in terms of like I think it's important to understand that it's not cryptocurrency that's the issue with the frauds, it's people hooking up with people on social media, getting involved in web forums and things like that, thinking they're gonna make a fast buck and handing over their money to the wrong people. That's what the frauds are. Well John's answered one major question that Commonwealth are at here. Yeah, but they haven't released a lot lately. But my what I hear on the grapevine is they are doing a lot, but they haven't released public information in relation to it. Any other questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me.